He is risen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day because it was Friday, but Sunday is here. And Father, we know as we celebrate together that nothing could hold our Lord in the grave. And he reigns victorious. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Teach us tonight from your word. We pray that we glorify our risen Savior. Amen. Amen. This time of the year, of course, brings back memories. Just three years ago, the year before COVID, my father passed away. I was already booked to preach Holy Week in Sweden. We were just coming back from Peru, Gloria and I, and we just, for the last time, saw her father, who just passed away last month. Both our fathers were born in the same year. And, uh, and my father, he often was complaining to me through the years, because I was a missionary. He knew the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was complaining to me, you're not going to be with me when I die. And I, of course, uh, give thanks to God, because basically I was in Florida, he was in Ohio, and the Lord uh, made it so that he went into a hospice, and I was able to be with him 18 hours before he passed away. We buried, with, we buried him, and then the next day I took a flight to Sweden. That's our Lord. That's his providence. When we trust him, he takes care of the details. Amen. And God, in the whole Easter story, there's some details. Lots of details that have a scope of time. I'm so happy to hear Brother or Pastor Doug's messages. You know, he takes us into a nice story of Jesus' encounters. But when we talk about the story of the risen Christ, it's a story that really is... It's the scope of the ages. And we're still in it. The story's not over yet. This is very important to understand. The other Sunday, I remember Pastor Roy, he gave us his life verse, that I may know him. And this verse goes so many different directions. It's a wonderful verse from Philippians chapter 3, because it speaks boldly of the power of the resurrection. It was the Apostle Paul's experience that he experienced the same resurrection power in his own life and ministry. But he also, you know, we like to hear that, but the second part is, and the fellowship of his sufferings. And that sometimes takes us by surprise. What's so good about fellowshipping with his sufferings? Well, we know that Jesus was a man of sorrows. And the whole story of his coming was one wrought with many things that were a threat to him. And we're going to look a little bit at that today. So my message today will be coming mostly from the book of Matthew. And we're going to start right at the beginning. In the book of Matthew, basically, we have two bookends. It's the women. The women of Jesus' lineage and the women that welcomed him when he rose again from the dead. Amen? Amen. When we read, like the beginning of Matthew, we're automatically confronted with like a genealogy. You know, if you read your Bible through in a year, you come to these passages of Scripture, he, and you can see right away, it's just a list of a chronology of people who lived, and they begot this person and the next person, or you have these lists of kings in Chronicles, or you have the lists of these rules in Leviticus. And sometimes when we approach these parts of the Bible, they may look a little bit boring, No! No! Sometimes you got to read, and you look. There's something going on here. And that's why I'm saying we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and within the first seven verses, we have four women mentioned. Usually it's man beginning man, son of father of son, and so on. But we have four women mentioned. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Matthew was affirming he is the king. And to be a risen king... He has a lineage. Now, the great story is what we call a meta-narrative. In the Bible, we have doctrine, we have teaching. Christ is the king. But why is he the king? Well, it's because of his story. He has royal lineage from the house of David. So this genealogy is very clear of the Davidic throne and lineage. Because this was the hope of Israel for their Messiah. <clears throat> So Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah. 
Our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And here we have Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now, the story of that is a type of stories of scandals. Perez begot Herzon, and Hezron begot Ram. And Ram begot Amindab, and Amindab begot Nashon. And Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Now, there's another woman with a story. But Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obad, Ruth. Oh, who's Ruth? Well, she was a Moabitess, and she was also grafted in as a believing daughter of, we know, Noemi. And so the story goes that we find that Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. He begot David. David the king. That's the important part. But we know that the glory of David also is a tarnish. The, David the king begot Solomon and by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Now we don't have the name of this woman mentioned, we know her name Bathsheba. She was the wife of Uriah, as it was stated. So here we have the lineage of Jesus Christ, the risen son of David, and there's four women in his genealogy. What does this tell us? Because the rest of the genealogy goes on with man and son and man and son until we come to verse 15 or 16, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband, of Mary. And we know that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, placed in the womb of Mary, and he became the Son of Man. He was the Son of God. He was born Jesus, who was called the Messiah, the Christ. And this is whom we worship. And Matthew announces him in all his glory. But Satan was not happy. Satan was already out. Because he knew God was up to something. And we see in the text that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they had to make an escape for their lives. As we read on in Matthew, we read about the flight into Egypt. And when chapter 2 of Matthew talks about, Now when they were departed, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise! Take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night. And they departed for Egypt. And it was there until the death of Herod. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. This is a verse that comes from Hosea chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11 is a minor prophet. Hosea was also asked to do something quite scandalous to portray who the God of Israel is, a faithful covenant keeping God. Hosea the prophet was asked to go marry a woman that would be unfaithful, Gomer. And therefore we're understanding that the story is filled with scandals. And these Old Testament saints looked forward unto the hope that was to come. In Hosea chapter 11, it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So they went from them, and they sacrificed to Baals and our idols and burned incense to carved images. But I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. And I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck and stoop down to feed them. This Messiah, the promise that was to come, the prophets already looked forward because they knew it would be glorious. So when we know of Jesus Christ, we saw that he was already with his people Israel. The story is quite brutal. We know that he was the Passover lamb. And he represented the children of Israel to be delivered from the hand of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was judged that Passover because of one thing that foresaw the greatest days, the greatest three days that ever existed. Because he could not.
take the blood of the ram and put it on the doorpost. Because he did not follow the God of Israel. And the angel of death did not pass over his house. And he lost his only son. This was Egypt. This was the curse. Because sin is real. And God is a God judging nations. And he's also judging his own people. And here we have the story of Egypt. But it's not done yet. Even today. Because we have a glorious passage that we need to look forward to. This is why we're in the story. And we're in the story for a reason. Because God has given all of us a purpose in this life. And the signs that we've seen already in the last two years, we know that the coming of the Lord may be very much something that we're going to see by our own eyes. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. But we've got to get orientated again. Because God has been merciful with us. He's given us understanding. But there's a lots of judgment prophets. And Isaiah is one. In Isaiah, we have the judgments upon various nations around Israel, how they treated them. And we know the judgments continue upon Egypt. But at the end of the prophecy of Egypt, there are some very powerful words that give a hope, a promise of resurrection. And they're read from Isaiah chapter 19. On that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And Assyria will come into Egypt. And Egypt into Assyria. These were the two nations that threatened Israel continually. Assyria eventually came in and destroyed the ten northern kingdoms. Assyria and Egypt, little do we know, perhaps if you know your church history, were two nations where the gospel went. And there's still two ancient churches that exist from the Egyptians and the Assyrians that are Christian. And therefore, it's not a hopeless cause. Because today, geographically, these two areas represent also the other great religion that has put so many people under their rule and feed is Islam. They're both captive to Islam and fear. But it says here, a blessing in the midst of the earth will come, whom Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, blessed, saying, May Egypt, my people, be blessed, and Assyria, the works of my hands. And my inheritance, Israel. Amen? Jesus Christ was the true Israel. When he hung on the cross, God fulfilled this promise. Out of Egypt, I will call my son Israel. Why was he true Israel? Well, it's very important to understand the scriptures in Matthew and the other gospels to know on the passion of the Christ, the reality of his death was, as we know, a sacrifice for sin. Now there's structures within the Bible that we know. Jesus Christ is Israel. He was the pure, he was the perfect Israel. Because Israel couldn't do Israel. They couldn't be per perfect and pure. So Jesus Christ came to this earth to fulfill Israel. So, if I'm going to ask you today, as good believing, Bible believing Christians, are you saved? How are you saved? What do you base your faith on? Anybody have any answer? I believe in Jesus, right? You're saved by what? Faith? Well, that sounds good. It sounds easy. And that's a problem today because there's lots of easy believism. But the reality is, you're saved by works. All of us are saved by works. We're saved by the works of Jesus Christ, the true Israel. And unless we understand that and the depth and the magnitude of that, we don't understand a holy God. It's easy today because we have 2,000 years, and of course 500 years south since the Reformation, you know, 100 years of easy believism, evangelicalism, that has gone to all the nations we are just so privileged to have heard the gospel, to hear the good news that there is no more condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. But that's why we remember these days. Because they are days 
that should grip us and move us and put us back in alignment with the gospel. Because it's good news. Because you could be very much. You know, the gospel is that. We're all going to be judged. And if you think you can pass that judgment, be my guest. Because God does judge. But that's what the gospel is. It's good news because it's clinging to Christ, the true Israel. Because he was judged for us. That's all we have. Otherwise, you want to stand before God? True, even in our believing, we will be judged as well as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5.10, the judgment seat of Christ by our works for him. This is everything. And it should orientate our lives because we're being directed with the end in mind. Amen? But when we get into this narrative here about the passion and what happened, and as we're bookending Matthew with the two witnesses, Mary Magdalene and Mary, Jesus' mother, we see a text from Matthew chapter 27 of what was going on as well. Just as Herod heard from those three wise men about this king of Israel. And he plotted and he schemed and he killed all the firstborn under the year of two. And Jesus went to Egypt. But the same plotting and scheming and conspiracy was going on the day of the Sabbath. By who? The so-called religious leaders of Israel. The Pharisees. So we know, crucifixion-wise, Joseph of Arimathea gave Jesus that tomb. What a story. And he gave him a shroud. And he was put in that. But Mary and Martha, they didn't, they didn't go yet to prepare his body. What did they do? They waited on the Sabbath. They honored God on the Sabbath. As they were good Jews. But what were the Pharisees doing on the Sabbath? It says, now on the next day, which is the day after the preparation, which was the Sabbath, the chief priests and Pharisees assembled before Pilate, saying, sir, we remember that while that deceiver was still alive, he said, after three days I will rise. So they were plotting. So therefore give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come and steal him and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pontius Pilate said to them, Well, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you know how. So they went with the guard of the soldiers and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. They plotted and they schemed and they did all they could in their own strength for that not to happen what they feared. Because they heard, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They heard, Jesus. See, when we look at the, the Pharisees, we have to understand, and these things are not very clear because we just hear always Pharisees and we think, oh, they're the bad guys, you know, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. Actually, Jesus was a Pharisee. Nicodemus was a good Pharisee. There were good Pharisees. There were two schools, the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel. House of Hillel, Pharisees were the ones that taught Gamayel, and we know who Gamayel was, was the teacher of Paul. But there was a coup d'etat of Pharisees in the year 10, when Jesus was a small boy. And uh, they took over the Sanhedrin. And they were the ones bringing these stringent rules. And they were as bad as the sin in the desert with the golden calf. This is what it says in Jewish writings. That this house of Shammai, of the Pharisees, they knew very well. Jesus condemned them in Matthew chapter 23. He had a very strong condemnation for him. And this is where we should take heed and listen as well. He said to the multitudes and his disciples, he said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They are so-called teachers of the law. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. Do what they say, but don't do as they do. For they say, and they do not do. They were hypocrites. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's soldiers. But they themselves will not move them with one finger. But all their works that they do, 
to be seen by men and make their selves look good. This was what was the Sanhedrin. These were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And he showed them all because he kept the law better than anyone. He kept the law perfectly. There was no one who came close. So when we have this, in the last chapters of Matthew, we know that now after the Sabbath, at the dawning of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and Mary the other came to view the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord, an angel descended from heaven and came up and rolled that stone away that those Roman soldiers and those Pharisees put in place. And he sat on it. He sat on the stone. The angel. You know? Now his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And the guards trembled from the fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. Just as he said, Come, see the place where he was lying, and go quickly and tell his disciples. He had been raised from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there. Behold, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them, saying greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. When Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers that they should go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The women who witnessed the greatest miracle of all time were his witnesses. Now why would we think that their names would be mentioned in Scripture? Because in their day, a woman's testimony didn't mean anything. So if these type of writings were given unto us, they were to show us from the beginning of Matthew to the end, how Jesus affirmed women. Amen? He was the great Savior. And for you tonight, wherever you are in your life, male or female, Jesus Christ is the same. Today, yesterday, and forever. Amen? He is our Lord. And He loves us. And He's revealing Himself to us. He gives us His Word. He gives us His testimony. The world does not understand this. And even ancient world, why would they put women as testimonies? They have no value. But it shows us that these are not fables, that these are not myths. This is not a creation of some ancient legends. These are documented testimony, testimonies of truth. But it goes on, and while they were going, behold, some of the guards of the soldiers went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that happened. Of course, they made a movie kind of out of this as well. Uh, I didn't see it this year, Gloria was watching it with uh, a friend in Italian called uh, Risen, right? Is it what it's called, Risen? About the Roman soldier, so they kind of make a backstory about it. I think it's a very, very powerful film, as Easter's good for films. So many different ones that we've watched over the years. And after they had assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave a rather large sum of money to the soldiers. So, well, telling them, Say his disciples came during the night and stole him while they were sleeping. So they even had, you know, a payoff, even though he was gone. So they had an excuse because they didn't know. And uh, really, that he had rose from the dead. So they thought, well, what had happened with the stone being rolled away, that actually his disciples came. So they had their story and uh, continued to create the narrative and uh, we live in a day where many stories are being told I don't know which ones are true and obviously it's nothing new people are trying to lead, deceive us all the time but I'm sure this will probably play out the same way on CNN today you know or any major news network no oh, you know hey, we, we have a report that the disciples stole Jesus by that's how it would go because no one wants to know the truth and to seek the truth, you shall be free. Many skeptics have been plagued with this question, and they've searched the truth, and they've always come with the facts 
the reality stares them straight in the face that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Amen? And if this matter is heard before the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they had it all covered. So they took the money and did as they were told and spread about all abroad this report among the Jews until this very day. Conspiracies are hard to cover up. Because we know in 1 Corinthians 12, as Elmore read, as you read that chapter of over 50 verses, that he was witnessed by 500 people. Not just the two women, but then his disciples as well. So in a court of law, what is the proof? They bring someone else as a testimony, as a witness. That's the only way it works. Because people say, well, try to scientifically prove that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, the only way you can do that is with witnesses. And that's what this Bible is all about. It's a book of witnesses. The Gospels are a book of witnesses. 1 Corinthians 15 is a statement of testimony, of witness. So this is what we have in the answer to the questions of life always come before us again. What will you do with Jesus Christ? What will you do with the reality that he rose from the dead? And what will you do as you look back and you've seen his faithfulness. Now, we celebrate again his resurrection. The tomb is empty. But where are we in this world today? That glorious tomb is empty. But we know the gate is still sealed because the story is not finished yet. And I love reading the book of Hebrews. You know, Jesus was the true Israel. He was given the task to die and complete the Torah, the law of God, the law of Moses, the ones the Pharisees talked about but didn't do. But that's not the whole picture. But we know the greatness of Christ's sacrifice. Therefore it was necessary, says Hebrews chapter 9, that the copies of things in heaven should be purified with these things. The whole temple, all the things that happened. You know, we know that the temple... His veil was torn when Jesus was crucified. And 70 years, or actually 40 years later, the temple no longer exists. To this day, that temple has never been rebuilt. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands. He went to the right hand of the Father, which are copies of the true. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year, with blood of another. No. That's why he cried, it is finished. And that is why we look at the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ with such admiration and love as it calls us every year not to forget that he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages he has appeared to be put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This is the blessing we have with the resurrection, is that we have power. The new, there's been a deposit given of the new covenant, the testimony in his blood. You have the power in belief, that power over sin, and to understand that the deposit, when you die, you have Jesus Christ as your salvation. For it is said, it is appointed for men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ has offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly await for him to come back again, to come a second time, apart from sin for salvation. That's why we celebrate Easter. And there's no story greater. It is the greatest story ever told. Amen? Amen. It's such a joy to celebrate this day with you today. I'm so thankful many of you woke up early and you already were there as the sunrise service. It was a beautiful day, no? Amen. Praise God, because we hear his word. And his words do not return empty. His words strengthen our hearts. They give us hope. We don't know when he's coming again. Could be soon. The gate is still sealed. But when we know when he comes, he's going to come through that gate. And he's going to establish his kingdom. In this world, he's going to bring justice. He's going to make all things right. And that's our hope, the blessed hope. Maranatha, 
Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. It's been a long day, but it's a long day well worth it for some of us. We all have different responsibilities. Thank you we can be here today to worship you. Thank you for the worship team and those that have ministered to us. All the glory of Jesus Christ will never fail us. Thank you that he fulfilled the works of the law so we can believe in him. Because he did it for us. He died then for us. And he rose and gave the deposit to show us the future. And what a glorious future he is. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. And we know today we can be strengthened in where we are in our own lives. That you, oh Jesus Christ, strengthen us in our walk with you. In our love for you. And let us continually give you praise. Thanking you for this Easter 2022. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.